Okay. So, uh, I'd like to thank very much organizers uh, for inviting me uh, to this interesting school. It's uh, my first time in India, and has been a very interesting experience. Uh, so, I would like just to say I'm a physicist, I'm not a mathematician. Uh, I kind of accidentally ran into this subject, I tried to explain how. Uh, uh, I'm here only today, so I compressed uh, my lectures in one kind of longer lecture, so I'm very sorry if I run over time. Uh, and uh, it's meant more, it will be very elementary uh, description of our subject. Uh, and uh, I, I didn't know what would be the audience, so I will be very vague about some details in physics. Uh, so in case you think it's vague or seems wrong, just interrupt and ask me. I can provide more details what I exactly mean by that. But for people who are interested in mathematics, they can ignore the details of that kind. Okay, great. So uh, let's start. Uh, so the thing, uh, the topic of this subject uh, is kind of unusual on, uh, in the conference on cluster algebras, and that's scattering of elementary particles. So this is the picture that is in many physics uh, talks. Uh, uh, I guess it's not so much in the math talks, and that's the picture of uh, the scattering experiments at LHC when particles bang in and they produce some, a lot of mass uh, going out. And this is the thing uh, we are interested in, even as uh, theorists, not just uh, particle experimentalists, because from theorists' point of view, the thing I am interested in is to describe what happens during the scattering process of elementary particles. I will say a little bit more just in a second what I mean by that. But there are some particles going in and there are some particles going out. There is a big blob in it. Uh, and from the theoretical point of view, uh, the answer was given a long time ago. And uh, the sum is uh, the, the thing which, how we should think about it from the theory point of view is the sum of Feynman diagrams. I will mention just in a second what these things are. Now, uh, this new picture, which has some very interesting connection to mathematics and also to this subject of cluster algebras, is that there is a different way how to talk about this thing, thing uh, in the blob, other than Feynman diagrams. And uh, this is something we call onshell diagrams, but the same diagrams appear in mathematics. They are called play big graphs. They are related to positive Grassmannian and cluster algebras. Okay, so let me start very slowly with the motivation. Uh, so elementary particles and forces. Uh, so we know that elementary particles, why do we care about them at all? Because they constitute all matter in the universe and not just matter, all. they also uh, carry forces that we know, the electromagnetism, weak, strong interactions, and the gravity. And uh, <coughs> the, the, the way how these forces reveal is in the interactions of elementary particles. So you probably heard about particles like electrons, quarks, photons, and gluons. Uh, these are the things we talk about. Now, our the theoretical framework to describe uh, this uh, uh, micro world is quantum field theory, developed by these gentlemen in the uh, 20s and 30s, but then reformulated by Feynman, Dyson, and Schwinger in the 40s and 50s. So this is the formulation we use. And formulation we use, and uh, uh, this is the way how I will, I will talk about quantum field theory. Uh, so it's our theoretical framework to describe elementary particles and their interactions. Uh, the basic objects are fields. Uh, roughly speaking, we start with a given theory, for example, uh, QED, uh, quantum electro electrodynamics, we have some elementary objects, the particles, here electron and photon, and uh, the way how we describe it is through Lagrangian, when we say which particles interact how. So, for example, here I, I kind of omit some of the details, but uh, we have two electrons interacting with photon, and we draw this picture called Feynman vertex, or in general we will, we will uh, do Feynman diagrams out of them. And there is some constant Q, which, mean, which denotes how strong the interaction is. So starting with Lagrangian, we have an associated picture. And from that, we can build some more complicated process. 
So what is the scattering amplitude now? Yeah, so for experts, I omitted some bar here. Yeah. Uh, so in general, uh, so what is the scattering amplitude, the thing that we are interested in here? And uh, uh, that's description of this process. We have some particles going in, something happens, and some particles go out into the final state. Now, quantum mechanics tells us that all final states are possible, uh, given certain constraints, and therefore, we cannot, if we have something going in, we cannot tell for sure what is going out. We can only say what is the probability that something is going out. And this probability, for a given initial state, that there is something going out into the final state, that probability or a function which is closely related to it is called scattering amplitude. And the scattering amplitude is parameterized by in and out state and the given theory, in a given theory. Uh, which describes some dynamics. Okay, so what can happen is, for example, in this case, we have two electrons going in and two electrons given out, so we have an amplitude for that. It's a function of energies and angles of the particles entering the process, so there are some kinematical data uh, that is parameterized, so that's amplitude for that. But we can also have a photon going out, so it would be a different amplitude, or many photons going out. So the question is, how do we describe what happens here inside for a given amplitude? And I already said that the, the way how we think about it in quantum field theory in terms of these Feynman diagrams. So, <clears throat> for example, in this simplest process, if we consider that the interaction is weak, it's not strong interaction, it's a weak interaction, uh, in the leading order, it's a perturbative expansion. So in the leading, in this parameter Q, which is this coupling constant, it's a strength of the interaction. So in the leading order, we just consider that the electron does nothing, that doesn't interact at all. And in the first, the subleading order, they interact through the picture like that. And then if we go higher and higher in the, uh, in the powers of Q, there will be more and more complicated Feynman diagrams. And the power of Q is given by the number of these vertices in a diagram. And we have huge, once we go to higher orders, we have a huge number of these diagrams. It grows. Also, you can notice that uh, this expansion is expansion in the number of loops in the diagram. There is no loops here. So this is no interaction at all. There is no loops here. We call it tree level. This is one loop diagrams, this is one loop, this would be two loop, three loop, and so on. The diagrams get more and more complicated, which contribute. And there is a way how to calculate these diagrams uh, uh, from, from the path integral using uh, the Lagrangian. So what is kind of the uh, schematic way how to do such calculation? So we draw all these Feynman diagrams, and for each diagram, we associate some function. And the way how we associate it is that uh, uh, we have uh, some expression for each straight line, like that for electron or that one for photon in this particular theory. So you see these lines here, here, and here. And we have also func some function associated with this vertex. So we just decompose the diagram into these building blocks, we take the product of all things that contribute, and that is the result. So this, it's called Feynman rules. This is the prescription how to convert the diagram like that into a formula. And if you want to learn more, you have to read one of these books, which explain everything. Uh, so, okay. So what's next? <clears throat> uh, so now, if uh, we want to go and see what particles are in the world, so what we actually see in the nature, we have to do some experiment. And the experiments to search for these particles are uh, uh, are experiments at the particle colliders. So this is uh, this is picture of LHC. Physicists like to put big rings on uh, on the maps. So this is the ring. Uh, it's uh, it's underground, and you accelerate the particles, and then you scatter them, you smash them together at very high speeds, and you produce new particles. And you just look there and try to see is there anything new? Do we understand everything there or not? Uh, now, uh, that looks simple in principle, but it's very hard in practice, because if you do such, a, such an experiment, most of the time what you see is something that you already knew. It's called background. 
uh, things that we already understand. We know that these particles that are there, but we want to look for new particles. Uh, but their effect is extremely small. So in order to see something new in a pool of old things which are understood, is that we have to understand, we have to be able to calculate this background very accurately to see any possible discrepancy from that background, from the known physics. And the known physics uh, is called the standard model of elementary particles. That's the menu of all particles in the nature and all their interactions and strengths that we know. If we want to so see something more, we have to do the experiment. But from the theoretical point of view, we have to be able to distinguish some new physics from the old physics. Now, what is the main source of this background, which is bugging us? And these are strong interactions, as I, as I already kind of uh, <coughs> spoke a little bit about QED, for electromagnetism. Uh, for strong interactions, uh, the theory is called QCD. Now, at colliders, we scatter protons at LHC, and we scatter them at very high energies. We accelerate them a lot, and we bang them into each other. And you can ask, from the theoretical point of view, what is the source, main source, of the contributions? So the proton is not an elementary particle. It's composed by quarks and gluons, which are inside. But if you scatter them at very high energies, these things are basically free. So we can think about them as scattering of gluons and quarks, and I just declare that the main component in these amplitudes, in the thing that we have to calculate, is the scattering of these gluons. They dominantly contribute. Yeah. So the standard procedure, how to do it, is to draw Feynman diagrams in this theory for gluons. They look like that. Uh, I denote the gluon by this wiggly line, and they interact, uh, and we have to just calculate all of them and calculate this background uh, of uh, the standard physics described by this uh, theory called QCD. Yeah. Oh, I mean, previously... Yeah, there is no electron here. So it's a different theory. Uh, that was a QED. There was an electron and photon. I just show it as an example because it's kind of the simplest one. In the thing that we are interested in here, so that was the electromagnetism, quantum electromagnetism. This is a different interaction. It's a strong interaction. This is the thing which dominates. The, the electromagnetism is there as well, but it's extremely weak. Yeah, so we don't have to worry about it that much. But the thing that dominates is the strong interaction, and there are different particles. So it's the quark and gluon which construct, which are inside the proton. So if we bang into each other these protons, they dominantly interact through this strong interaction. It's the, the dominant part. And uh, I can also write the Lagrangian. It's a little bit more complicated. But the thing that we have to construct are the diagrams with uh, these gluons. There can be also quarks in these diagrams. But at the leading order in this perturbative expansion, it's just the gluons which interact. So the here, real, rule, rule of the game is that you have to draw all diagrams uh, with three-point and four-point vertices, these gluons. Yeah. So you see the diagram has only three-point vertices. That one has some four-point vertex. That's what, we, what would come from that Lagrangian. That we, you have to do that. Yeah, yeah, there will be some, something is going in, something is going out. I just ignore all of that, yeah. Well, it's kind of, uh, once you calculate the thing with something going in and out, you can kind of reverse the order of these arrows. Uh, yeah, there is some symmetry between that. So in the end, we just basically worry about the case when everything is going in or everything is going out. And in the end, we just decide which was going in, which was going out. Yeah. Uh -huh. You don't have to do these calculations separately. Okay, so what are the calculations? Or how? It's a very simple procedure. I basically outline it. Yeah, it's a, some toolbox of things that you do. Well, but the problem is that once you actually do it, it becomes uh, rather complicated. So people already did it a long time ago because they, not from today's point of view, where there was no LHC, but even in uh, early 80s, when there were plans for these big colliders, they, they needed to do these calculations in order, as I said, to actually see some new physics there. And even uh, despite it looks very simple in principle, the status of the art in early 80s was that 
people could calculate the interaction when two gluons go in, they smash into each other, and three gluons are produced in the final state. And at the leading order, as I said, there was this perturbative tension at the leading order, there are no loops, everything are just tree diagrams. So that's what people were able to do at that time. And if you do that calculations, you get 24 pages like that for this particular pro process. Well, and this is relatively simple algebra. There are some scalar products of some vectors here. Uh, this is the tiny thing here. But uh, you see that even for almost the simplest thing you can possibly imagine, the results get very long. So maybe that's just what you get. Yeah, nobody promised you that the result would be simple in any way. But there was the need for doing these calculations. So, so what, what is next? So if you continue there, do you see something simple or not? Or if this, that is, does it just get more and more messy? And uh, so that's kind of the beginning of the story of these scattering amplitudes, is this calculation. So the next uh, on the wish list was the next process two going in, four going out. So it's, these, it's the amplitude with six particles uh, in that process. And for that, you, uh, if you draw all of them, that would be 220 of these Feynman diagrams, I said before, and you would produce 100 pages of the result like that. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, it's what it is. And uh, these gentlemen did it in 1985 using, that time, supercomputers in 1985. And uh, they produced a paper uh, which, is which has the very simple name, gluonic 2 goes to 4. And even in the abstract, they write uh, they, the cross-section, which is tightly related to the amplitude. It's a square of amplitude in that case. For two gluons to four gluons, scattering is given in a form suitable for fast numerical calculations. So that was kind of the thing that people want, fast numerical calculations just to get some formula they can use in making these predictions. OK, the paper has 14 pages. Yeah, it may be not so visible. There are some terms. They classify them. There is some tables of coefficients in, of, in front of these terms, some symmetry factors, and so on. OK, but they realized in the year that these 14 pages simplifies to a single line formula which I, I, I will say what are these variables here. They are called spin or helicity variables. I will talk about it just in a second. So when you see a formula like that, uh, you see, despite I didn't tell you what these brackets are, you already see some structure. There is one, two here. There is two, three, three, four, four, five, five, six, and six, one. Suppose that somebody asks you to do the endpoint analyzation of this formula. So you may probably immediately guess that you just they, the product of all these consecutive, the, the, these brackets with consecutive indices. And that was indeed the true for some endpoint scattering, when two going in and n minus two going out. In that case, you would basically, for any n, would have to write, draw infinite number of Feynman diagrams in order to do it. But the result is given just by a single formula. So this is slightly, this is very surprising, and it's slightly bothering that such a simplicity is invisible in these Feynman diagrams. So what is going on? So that was basically the start of that amplitude field. People try to understand what is going on and eventually use it for some efficient calculations, how to do it differently than using this textbook uh, Feynman diagrams approach. And uh, people did many different things. So there was a huge progress in understanding what is going on in the structure of these amplitudes and how to do these uh, calculations very efficiently. And uh, there are <clears throat> many people are involved. There are separate workshops and conferences when people report new results. But uh, the thing that I'm mostly interested in is not really doing these precision calculations for these colliders. The thing how I motivate it, why it's done, it's a very good motivation, valid. But the thing that I'm more interested in is to see some new structures in the quantum field theory, especially because it's connected to some interesting mathematics, which is also part of uh, this program. OK, and that leads us to on-shell diagrams. OK, so what is the problem with these Feynman diagrams? And it's something called gauge invariance. Uh, I can say just technically what it is, but let me just more, more, more hand wave way say what it means. So the photon or gluon, uh, 
Uh, here we are, we talk about these gluon amplitudes, but the same thing would apply to the, the photon, which carries electromagnetism. They, these particles can be in two different quantum states. Uh, we, we say that they have two different helicities, plus or minus. There are two different states. The problem is that uh, in quantum field theory, we use a four vector to describe these two states. And that's a redundancy because four vector has four components, not two. Now, we can easily remove one of these components and get only three. But going from three to two becomes a problem. You have to basically say that there is some equivalence class of vectors which describe the same states. And that's exactly what is the problem with Feynman diagrams. Because you use the objects which describe three degrees of freedom, despite your object describing your real particle has only two degrees of freedom. And that is called gauge invariance or gauge redundancy. So, the, uh, so in the, it's, but it's built in, in this Feynman diagram prescription. So if you have Feynman diagram like that, the internal line, uh, you see these lines, uh, these external lines, these are real particles. So we also sh say that they are on shell. I will say what is on shell just in a second. But these are real particles. But this thing in the middle, it's not a real particle. It's virtual. It's just in that diagram. Nobody will ever measure it. Yeah? It's just how this perturbation theory is constructed. You have to draw all diagrams with all possible interactions. But the things that you really measure, which is real in nature, are these things on outside, not these things on inside. Now, the problem is that these things on outside have two degrees of freedom, but these things on inside has three degrees of freedom, because it's not real. Yeah. So, and that's the problem with, uh, with Feynman diagrams, that uh, they have these off-shell particles, and that means that they, they don't really describe particles with two degrees of freedom, but three. But in the end, everything has only two degrees of freedom. So in the end, there is some redundancy. Things must cancel between the different diagrams, and everything should be fine in the end. But this redundancy exactly creates this unnecessary complexity in Feynman diagrams, which we saw already in this Park-Taylor calculation. Now, what are on-shell diagrams is something very different. So this is a Feynman diagram for these gluons. Uh, it would look like that. So this is not three, this would be called one loop, because it's higher in this perturbation theory, it has an internal loop in it. We would draw on-shell diagram, would look similar here, but what we mean by these blobs in the vertices is something very different. Now, all lines in the picture are on-shell. These are all physical particles, there is no gauge redundancy, but the meaning is very different between these objects. Yeah? So I explain just in a second uh, how we would calculate such a diagram. But I just want to make a distinction. This is a Feynman diagram. These things are unphysical. This is an on-shell diagram. All these things are physical. It looks slightly weird because we can never measure the thing here in the middle, but it's a physical particle, yeah? which uh, means that uh, there is not really it's not the same interpretation as here. Yeah? We cannot use the conventional interpretation in quantum field theory that particle could go in, produce something in the middle, and then it decays again into two. This has no such a meaning. This has a meaning of that. Yeah? These things are virtual, they are in the middle, but here we demand that these things are physical, and then we lose this physical interpretation. But what it turns out that despite we lose completely physical interpretation in this diagram, we will gain the mathematical. We will gain some new mathematical structure, which is not here, but will be here. In addition to huge simplification of the actual formula. So let me now talk about the kinematics. So I already used these words before and uh, these formulas, so I make it more precise. So we talk about massless particles, so particles which don't have any masses. So the electron has mass, quark has mass, but the gluon or photon doesn't have mass. So we will talk about them here. Now, all information about the particle can be described by the helicity. I already say that the particle can be in two different quantum states. So the helicity is either plus or minus. I can call it like that. And there is uh, momentum. That's a four vector, which describes the energy and speed or velocity of the particle, everything that you need to know from a kinematical point of view is in this momentum. On-shell means that P-square 
the square of this momentum is equal to zero, or in general is equal to mass square, but the mass is zero here, so p square is zero. So when the particle is on shell, p square is zero, when it's off shell, p square is not zero. And that was the, diff that was the distinction between this thing here and this thing here. Here p square is zero, here p square is not zero in these middle lines. Okay, now uh, we will not use p mu, the four vector, uh, instead of that, uh, we will repackage the information. Instead of one four vector, we would have two spinners. So lambda and lambda tilde, with some index a and a dot, both of them run from one to two. So we can repackage that information. There is a simple formula how to go from here to here, but I will not bother you with that formula. Now, uh, the, we can then introduce a kinematical invariant. So if we have two particles with p1 and p2, two different uh, momenta, for momenta, uh, we can now write it in terms of these spinners, and we introduce invariants. So there are brackets, uh, it's called angle brackets, one and two, these are the particle labels, particle one and particle two, and this is just epsilon contraction on these A indices of two spinners for that particle, or it's a two by two determinant if you just write it next to each other. And then square bracket, that's the other type of spinners. Yeah, so this is all the kinematical invariants, all the information we will need will be written in terms of these objects. Okay, now, uh, <clears throat> what are the simplest amplitudes we can possibly have for these uh, gluons? These are three-point amplitudes. So, uh, three particles meet at one vertex. If there were two, there is no interaction. That means nothing, just the particle goes through without interacting. So the first non-trivial case is when three of them meet in one vertex. And that I am just declaring here. Uh, if we talk about, I said that uh, there are these two different quantum states uh, called helicity. The only possibilities is that at this one vertex, three particles meet if uh, Two of them have one helicity, and the third one has different helicity. So plus, plus, minus, or minus, minus, plus. There cannot be anything like plus, plus, plus. Yeah, so it doesn't exist. That thing is zero. But these two are different. So in all the pictures you will see later, for this case, uh, I use the white vertex for that one, the blue vertex. So this is one three-point amplitude. This is the other three-point amplitude. And now uh, the three-point kinematics is very constraining. Uh, in each vertex there is something called momentum conservation, which means that in terms of these momenta I introduce, the sum of the momenta must be zero in the vertex, if everything is considered incoming. And that, if you translate it in terms of these spinner helicity variables, in terms of these spinners, that forces that in each vertex one of the spinners, the spinners of one type for all three particles are proportional. If they are proportional, all these invariants are zero, yeah? because it's, an, it's a determinant of two vectors or two, two component vectors which are proportional, so determinant is zero. So therefore, the only non-zero ones are the, the brackets of this kind. Here, the brackets of the lambda tilde chi type. Here, the brackets of this uh, lambda type. And now we associate, we can calculate them, uh, what are the three-point amplitudes? And the three-point amplitudes uh, here, you don't actually have to, any, to calculate anything just based on some principles of quantum field theory, uh, Lorentz invariance or Poincaré invariance. One can directly write an expression. There is a unique expression for there, but doesn't matter. The details don't matter. There is some expression using these spinners we write for that amplitude and for that amplitude. So this bracket in the numerator, the AB, means these are the indices of these two particles which are plus. So for example, one and two to the four, and then you divide by this structure here. Here the same thing, A and B are the particles which are minus, to the four divided by all other brackets in the denominator. Yeah, because like A, the, the plus particles are special here, so there is something called little group scaling, which means that if you take the particle with plus helicity and you rescale the lambda and lambda tilde, the lambda is scaled in one way, lambda tilde in the opposite way. The, thing, thing, the full thing must scale like something. The 
I'm, not, I'm omitting the details. But the Lorentz symmetry forces some scaling in this lambda and lambda tilde, which forces us to write this expression. It would be a unique solution to some scaling expression, some scaling constraint. Yeah, so these A, B labels are the ones where we have plus helicity here. These A, Bs are the ones with minus. Because the same expression you get if you rotate, what do you, if it is not plus, plus, minus, but plus, minus, plus, it's the same thing, just this A, B changes. Yeah. Okay. And we can also write these formulas for other elementary particles. It didn't have to be these gluons, but I just proceed with these gluons because um, that's what our story will be about. Okay, now, so that was just for vertices. So what is now this on-shell diagram? So, and we get the on-shell diagram using amalgamation procedure. We just glue together these three-point vertices. So if I draw a diagram like that, what I really mean is the product of these four, four vertices. And I gave you the formula for the vertices. Now, here, there is a problem. What do you mean by these internal legs? So I just label them. Let's say, let's see that this is A, B, C, and D. E. Now, the point is that all these internal legs, unlike in Feynman diagram, are on shell and physical. So I can talk about this vertex as really a physical three point amplitude because all these particles are physical particles. Now, these A, B, C, D legs in the middle, are, they are all fixed by the momentum conservation. If you demand that uh, the momentum is conserved in each vertex, you can calculate A, B, C, D spinners in terms of one, two, three, four spinners. Yeah, so everything is completely fixed. So once you do that, once you, I take these formulas I gave you before, I put the A, B, C, Ds there, I calculate, solve for A, B, C, D using one, two, three, four. I take the product of all of that. Here I chose some particular helicities, minus, minus, plus, plus. So after the dust settles, after you do the, all the calculation, uh, we get a formula which looks like that. Yeah. And that is already kind of reminiscent from what we saw in this motivational part with the Park-Taylor formula. It is exactly the same structure. There is something to the four divided by the product of these cyclic, uh, cyclic brackets. Now, Note that uh, here, so this is actually a four-point amplitude. It's a full amplitude when two goes in and two goes out, the four-point amplitude for gluons, given by this single diagram. Now, it's a single on-shell diagram. If you write it using Feynman diagrams, there will be three diagrams which contribute, and they will look very differently. This is a diagram with loop, but this is uh, only a three-level amplitude, so in terms of Feynman diagrams, there will be no loops. Yeah, it would be a diagram which has one four-point vertex, or that would be two diagrams which have two three-point vertices with some internal propagator. So there is a sharp contrast here. What is that and what is that? Here, this is a loop, but it's not a loop Feynman diagram. It's not what we would normally think about as a loop diagram, because it's an on-shell diagram. These things in the loop are on-shell, and they are completely fixed by, this, uh, by the kinematics on the external lines. Okay. So once we have this definition, we can now draw arbitrary diagrams. Yeah. We just construct diagrams with black and uh, with the white and blue vertices. And the definition of what we mean by that picture is the product of these three-point amplitudes in the corners. And for each diagram, there are two natural numbers which are associated with that. One is n. That's the number of external lines. That's the trivial one. And the other one is k. From the physics point of view, the k is the number of these negative, these minuses, negative helicity gluons. But from the graph theoretical point of view, there is some formula for that. It's twice the number of blue vertices plus number of white vertices minus the number of propagators. It will be closely related to what we then mean in the GK and Grassmannia. Yeah, it will be related to that. But from the physics point of view, it's the number of minuses. From graph point of view, it's uh, this expression. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, well, there is, uh, well, uh, the thing is that uh, you can choose, uh, sub here by definition we say that everything is going in. If you want a process when some of them go in and some of them go out, the only thing that you need 
is to flip the momentum that it's not going in, but it's not P, but minus P. And the other thing is that you have to flip the helicity. So instead of plus, you say it's minus. But that's all. Everything is included here. Yeah, everything in and out is included. But if we go from in to out, we have to flip some things. We have to flip the direction of the direction of the velocity, so the momentum, and we have to flip the helicity for that. But otherwise, everything is included. OK. Now, uh, there is a prescription how to build the three-level amplitudes as a sum of these diagrams. It's called recursion relations, uh, BCFW, named uh, after the initials of people who invented that. Uh, it's relatively recent. It's very surprising. It's, uh, it was not, of course, uh, it was not found in terms of these on-shell diagrams. I am just translating the language of these recursion relations into the on-shell diagrams. The on-shell diagrams came much later. The idea is very simple, and at the graph, at the level of these diagrams as uh, just the graphs, it's a very nice, simple procedure. And uh, what, it's a recursive procedure. So suppose that you already calculated everything up to n minus one point, and you want to calculate the next one, the n point. And the way how it works is that you take all legs and you partition them into two sets. And then choose two special legs and add a bridge on top of that. And then you sum over all partitions. So this is it. So here, left and right, are the smaller amplitudes. So they are already sums of on-shell diagrams. You do it recursively. I already did it for up to n minus one point. You just bridge them. Uh, you connect them by the, by the line. And you add this structure on top of it called BCFW bridge. And you do the same bridge for all such a partitions. And then you sum over all partitions. Now, know that all the diagrams I draw have a cyclic ordering. So the cyclic ordering is important here. There is an ordering from 1 to n, and all the diagrams are planar. I will make some note about the non-planar ones later, but everything is planar, and there is a cyclic ordering. On the physics side, the, physic, the cyclic ordering comes from the fact that if, just more precisely, for the ones who know something about it, the amplitude doesn't have cyclic ordering, but it also has some SU and group structure. So the way what you do is you factor out traces of the generators of SUN, but there is a cyclic ordering in these traces. They impose the cyclic ordering on the remaining kinematical part. And then you sum over all possible uh, permutations, modulo cyclic orderings. Yeah. So there are some details. But in the end, we care just about the thing which has cyclic ordering. OK, so this is the recursive procedure. So let me show it on examples. So the first, the first thing is uh, four point. So the diagram that we already constructed. Uh, how would you see it here? So we start with one term. We call it factorization channel. That doesn't matter. So uh, this is uh, the elementary term. There is a three point amplitude here and three point here. Three point we know by definition. These are our building blocks. Uh, we connect them. And now we add the bridge on the legs four and one. So this is the original thing, and here we edit the bridge. And here, as it turns out, this is the only thing that you can possibly have. No other diagram. If you add the bridge on some other partition of Lex, respecting cyclic ordering, they will immediately vanish. In the language we will see later, they will be non-reduced. Yeah. Uh, so there is only one diagram here. Now, if you do the five-point amplitude, it's a recursive process. We start with four-point we have here. That's this blob. We add the three-point amplitude, which is just blob here. We connect them. And we add this BCFW bridge on top of that. And in that case, there is also only one diagram, uh, one partition of legs, which is possible, consistent with adding this bridge. And this is the full five-point amplitude. And that's it. That's this expression. Here, the AB again depends on how we choose these helicities. And this thing, if you write it as Feynman diagrams, it would be sum of 10 Feynman diagrams. Here, it's just a single graph. So I hope it's clear what I mean by that formula. This recursive process, uh, dividing the legs into two sets, and uh, adding this bridge on top of it. I will show, yeah, this is the more complicated example. Now, this already immediately explains why the Park-Taylor formula is so simple. 
It was explained using some other methods earlier than that, but here in the diagram, from the diagrammatic point of view, it's actually very nice, because if you do this recursion, then for the amplitude these guys calculated, only one diagram will contribute to any number of points. Always one will be in this recursion. And you can show that the one will have exactly this form, and here you increase the number of these indices. Unlike in Feynman diagrams, when you would just grow very quickly. It actually grows some factorial, uh, factorial growth or some double factorial growth. So, okay. So uh, this is the explanation of the simplicity because in terms of these onshell diagrams, there is actually only one diagram which contributes and therefore the result is expectedly simple. Now, in general, so uh, I just uh, have to say that this Park-Taylor formula, if you think about it in terms of these helicities, it was not the general thing. It was the simplest possible, uh, <coughs> simplest possible uh, set of helicities when two of them were minus and the rest was plus. You can, then, uh, you can then think maybe if all of them are plus is simpler than that, or one of them is minus and the rest is plus. In fact, these amplitudes are all zero, so they are in, indeed they are simpler, but they are just too simple. They are all zero. So this is the first non-zero one. But of course, we, in, in general, we care about the amplitudes which have other distribution of helicities, not just the simple one. And in that case, we get a sum of onshell diagrams. Now, not, it's not a simple diagram, but a sum of onshell diagrams. So in this particular case, when we have three minuses and three pluses, we get three diagrams. You can already see an avatar of this recursion here. There is a five point, ad, five point and three point adding six one bridge. 4 and 4, adding 6, 1 bridge. 3 and 5, adding 6, 1 bridge on top of that. So this constructs uh, the six-point amplitude with that helicity. Now, the k, the number of these minuses, is given by the k of this graph. Yeah, I already gave you the formula, so there are different graphs which contribute here. There would be a different graph which would be in this helicity configuration for the Taylor formula. Okay. So st we get a sum of diagrams, but still, uh, it is, uh, if, you want to, if you want to do these Feynman diagrams, it would be 220 in that case. And you would get horrible expressions. Here, you get reasonable expressions. You can write each of them on one line. So the sum is three lines, yeah, something like that. Okay, now important thing are identity moves. So <clears throat> let's say I have one onshell diagram. And I do, a, I do a following move on the diagram. So whenever I have two adjacent blue vertices or white vertices, I can merge them into one and expand them in the other channel. So in physics, you would say that it's an S and T channel, so you can kind of interchange between them. And the expression for the diagram doesn't change. Yeah, it's the same value for the diagram. And so that one is kind of more trivial, but the more interesting one is something called square move. So anywhere in the graph, if you have this square, you can flip the blue and white vertices like that. And the value of the graph doesn't change either. Yeah? So these are, two, uh, these are two moves which don't change the value of the graph. So what is the example? So for example, I take this diagram, and I do the move on this chain of these two white vertices, and then I do the, so this I do the merge expand, and then I do the square move on this one, and if I rotate it, after I do it, I get this diagram, which looks very different from this one, but it's just related by these identity moves. And if we evaluate it using these three-point amplitudes, it gives the same expression. So, Obviously, different diagrams are the same after these moves, so there must be some better description, more invariant way how to talk about them, not just the product of three-point amplitudes and for a given diagram. Okay, so let me say like more precise statements here, because I'm very vague in all these physics <laughs> uh, statements. So the only thing that we care are planar diagrams, planar onshell diagrams at this moment, with one of type of particles, let's say gluons. Concretely, the thing that I'm really doing and that we understand is the story for planar n equals four super young theory. And uh, it is for T-level amplitudes 
and for loop integrands. So when I say loop amplitudes, I really mean loop integrands. In quantum field theory, you have to then integrate over the loop momenta. You produce some transcendental functions. This is the story I'm not talking about. We don't understand it completely. Or actually, we understand little, very little about it at the moment. This is too complicated. <laughs> so this is like more precise statement where I say loop amplitudes and so on, what I mean by that. So of course, in general, we can also consider non-planar oriented graphs. Here, there was no orientation on if we want to include more general structures, not just this theory, but non-supersymmetric, not just planar limit, and other theories, we would have to consider non-planar graphs, oriented graphs, and with more types of particles. Here, everything was just one types of lines, uh, but if you have more types of particles, you would have to consider different types. So there, are, there is a vast set of generalizations one can go from that, but let me stick with what we know about and go farther. These diagrams can be easily constructed. Yeah, I can draw a non-planar diagram. I can draw a diagram which has some orientations here on these uh, legs. But at the moment, we don't know how to construct the amplitude from diagrams like that in other theories than the one I'm talking about. Okay. But for those who, who didn't hear about n equals 4 super young modes, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's, it's the thing that we understand. OK, so this kind of ends the physics part of the talk. Now, I start from scratch, from some other direction, and then we will see that these things uh, actually merge in the end. So let me change the wheel. So uh, maybe if there are some questions uh, uh, here. Yeah, they did. Well, they disappear. Well, of course, the, we have to say what are these point amplitudes, because that's the en entry point. Uh, they are completely fixed by just uh, Lorentz symmetry, which means that if you tell me what are the particles in the story, you say there are gluons there, so these are spin one particles. You say there are some plus and minus helicity. This is enough to for me to reconstruct the expression. So the Lagrangian. Yeah, goes away partially. Yeah, goes away. There are no Lagrangians later, but you might say that the Lagrangian enters the definition of the three point amplitude. And that's the only thing. Yeah, you can kind of forget about the rest. Well, this is still the physics method. There will be this math approach to it, which then doesn't look like Lagrangian at all. This still has some reminiscence because. Uh, here, we don't have Feynman rules, we don't have Feynman vertices, but we still have to say what are these three-point amplitudes we glue together, and then, in principle, we get from Lagrangian. But we don't have any propagators or anything like that. We don't have standard loops, as in the Lagrangian approach, so we have the rules of the, different, the, rules of the game are different, but it's still somehow connected to... There is still a theory in the beginning. Yeah, still the n equals four super Young's theory is somewhere there, but we, in the starting point. Yeah, but uh, so despite this is very nice and it's a different way how to think about physics, it's still physics. Yeah, it still has all everything uh, to say more words. These recursion relations, uh, which I spoke about here. This is the way how the unitarity works for scattering amplitudes. Unitarity means that, well, okay, these are physics words, maybe might mean nothing for most of the mathematicians. But if you have an amplitude, you put one internal particle on shell, the amplitude should factorize into two. So this is unitarity. The recursion relations is just the way how to use unit unitarity to reconstruct the amplitude. So everything what I said is a different way how to think about physics. I would say much better way, much uh, more effective, at least in the theories we understand it, but it's still physics. Yeah. Uh, but the thing that I will start now, uh, yeah, start from a different, uh, different entry point to the story. Okay. Uh, more questions here? Yeah, please, free to stop me and interrupt. Yeah. Does 
This. Now, this is the amplitude. This is the endpoint. This is tree level. Actually, this picture is tree level. There is a generalization of this formula for loops, but uh, okay, I'm just showing the tree level. This is the endpoint amplitude. So, n gluons go in. And this is how to recursively build it. Yeah. No, 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 no. A n is an endpoint amplitude, not a root system. Yeah, no. I, I don't know at least, yeah, but not what I, how I think about it, yeah. Uh, okay, more questions? Okay, so, uh, so I hope I explained uh, kind of the basics, but for people who don't care much about physics, these graphs are interesting for us. We know how to calculate some functions called amplitudes we care about. They are useful, and uh, yeah. So now let's start from a different uh, point of view with permutations. So we change uh, the wheels completely. Okay, so here is the problem. We want to graphically represent permutation of n labels. 1 to n going to sigma 1 up to sigma n. So how do we do it graphically? Well, there is a simple way how to do it. You just draw as, uh, n points on the button and points on the top, and you just connect them with lines. Okay, so that's the way how to represent permutations like that. Now, it's interesting that even this primitive uh, kind of dumb way how to do it already represents a scattering process. So you can actually think about it as scattering of elementary particles. When these particles go in and these particles go out, and this would be a Feynman diagram for that, the only problem is that this is a scattering process in one plus one dimension, so in two dimensions. And... Uh, well, the thing that I discussed before and the thing we care about is not two dimensions, but four dimensions here. Because our world is four dimensional, so if we eventually, after a long process of calculations, want to actually calculate scattering of gluons at LHC, uh, the result in one plus one dimension is not the one we are interested in, especially because the gluons have zero degrees of freedom. Okay, so but it's already interesting, but this picture is definitely useful for other purposes. There are other interesting things in one, one dimensions we can do. Yeah, I'm not saying it's not, but for the, our purpose, this is not what we want. Okay, now, in addition, these pictures are not unique because they satisfy something called Young-Baxter move. So if you take this permutation uh, or this picture and you move this line to crossing this middle point and you get this picture, you get the same permutation. It doesn't change. So the diagrams in this one plus one dimensional picture are not unique. So that is fine, this young Baxter move. Okay. Now, uh, this, as I said, this doesn't work in three plus one dimensions, but kind of uh, the reason for that, the fundamental reason for that is that if you really think about this as a scattering, the fundamental vertices are four points. Yeah, you see that these vertices, four particles meet at this vertex. But in four dimensions, the fundamental vertices are three point. We already discussed that before. The kind of the basic interaction is when three particles meet in a point, not four. And, but these here, it's four. Yeah? So, uh, okay, so the thing that we want is to represent permutation using graphs with three point vertices, not four point vertices. Yeah? So that's the thing that we want to do. Well, however, there is an original problem. So here, uh, if we want to represent permutation in this original picture, how do I know that 4 goes to 6? 4 enters the vertex, and then the rule is that it leaves the vertex in the middle. Right? It doesn't go left, it doesn't go right, it goes straight. And here it goes straight. Yeah? It just goes straight through each vertex. Well, if we have three-point vertices, there are two options. It goes either left or right, and they are both equally good. So whatever we have, it cannot have a single three-point vertex. It needs to have two different three-point vertices. So because there are two different, I would say, non-trivial permutations for three labels. So one, two, three goes either to two, three, one, or one, two, three goes to three, one, two. Uh, there are also the more trivial one, when one goes to one, two goes to two, three goes to three, or one goes to one, two goes to three, and three goes to two. But this would be more trivial. So the non-trivial one are these two. You can see, so in this simple case, uh, we can actually represent graphically the permutation using just this single vertex, when the rule is that 
uh, the white blob means that if I go in, I need to uh, leave left, I have to turn left, and here, if I go in for the blue one, I turn right. Yeah, so here it trivially, one goes to two, two goes to three, three goes to one, and here one goes to three, three goes to two, two goes to one. Yeah, so two different permutations. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Okay, so now this is the result of Postnico, that if you now glue together these diagrams, uh, these, these vertices together, uh, they represent a permutation. Yeah? So for any permutation, there is a diagram like that, which, uh, which comes from gluing together these uh, three-point vertices. And uh, it is the rule which I set here. So how do I read off the permutation? So for the white vertex, I always turn left. For the blue vertex, I turn right. Let's just do it. So, <clears throat> so let's take one. So one goes to blue vertex, turns right, and then turns left, uh, and then turns right, and then turns left. So one goes to five. Okay, let's do two. So two turns left, then turns right, then turns left, then turns right. Two goes to four, and so on. Yeah? So there is a simple rule, this uh, left-right paths, how to read off the permutations from diagram like that. And any permutation can be, uh, can be uh, associated with such a diagram. Now, are these diagrams unique? So that's a question. So the answer is they are not, because there are identity moves on these diagrams which don't change the permutation. And these, we already saw before in a different context. Uh, so if I, in the diagram, merge and expand to two vertices of the same color, or I do this square move, it doesn't change the permutation. So the diagrams are not unique, or they are unique modulo these identity moves. Okay? You can easily use the simpler exercise just anywhere inside the diagram if you have that. Uh, for example, if here one goes to three, you go uh, either this path or you would go this path, but you don't change where one goes. Yeah, one always goes to three here, but uh, just the path changes inside this sub-diagram. Okay, so for example, I draw these two diagrams. They look different, uh, but I calculate their permutations, and they are the same permutations for both of them. Yeah, so you can do that simpler exercise. Uh, you just calculate the permutation for that and for that. If they are the same, they must be related by these identity moves. Now, let's look at this young Baxter move, uh, going back this thing with uh, the four point, uh, with this original example. So let's, uh, let's, I can do two, I have, I have four point vertex in the original picture, the scattering in one, one dimension. So I have now three point vertices, so I have to do some replacement. Either, naturally, replace the four point vertex by this picture or by this picture. I can choose, doesn't matter. Yeah. So uh, there might be more complicated ways how to do the replacement. So if this replacement, I start with that picture, uh, when the, this line was on the left, I replace it, I get uh, the <coughs> now on shell diagram, and I use uh, these identity moves, I use merge expand here, I get that, so here I merge to expand this uh, blue vertices, and then I do the square move on the middle one, and then I do the merge expand on this white vertices, I get this picture, and I then back collapse what I meant, if I, I back collapse uh, it into four point vertices using the same rule I used, I get this picture. So the young Baxter move is a consequence of uh, the square move and merge expand if you just expand the four-point vertex. So it's included here. Uh, okay. Now, uh, so these diagrams, uh, Postnikov called playback graphs. Now, the diagrams which represent permutations are not all diagrams, but they, call, they are called reduced diagrams. 
I will not go into definition of what the reduced means. It means there is no internal bubble in the diagram. So whenever you do any moves, you will never reveal that there is a bubble inside the diagram. The bubble kind of screws things up. OK. Now, just from the diagrammatic point of view, exactly these diagrams are relevant for three-level amplitudes. These are the same diagrams we would encounter if we do the cal this calculation with on-shell diagrams. So just from the diagrammatic point of view, the information to fully reconstruct three-level amplitudes is given by a set of permutation. I don't have to draw the diagram. You just give me permutation, and I can write code in Mathematica, which gives from the, it goes from the permutation to the graph. So, so far in physics, once I have the graph, I would still have to take the product of three-point amplitudes and write a formula for that. But the invariant information, but that can be all done automatically. This is an automatic process. The invariant information is a set of permutations. Yeah? Uh, so I can go from permutation to on-shell diagram. But how do I calculate the on-shell diagram? It's still this product of three-point amplitudes, the thing which knows about the physics of quantum field theory. OK, so now uh, the po how the, does the positive Grassmannian enter the story? And uh, there are many people who contributed yeah, I'm, uh, to that. So the same diagrams came up in a very different context. Uh, now, not in combinatorics, but in algebraic geometry. And uh, here, the task is something very different. But in the end, you will see it's connected to these permutations. Now, the question is that we would like to, we start with k by n matrices, modulo GLK, so it's a Grassmannian GKN, but uh, normally what people consider is the complex Grassmannian and so on, so now we restrict to a real Grassmannian, real entries, and in addition, we would like to impose a funny condition that all maximal minors k by k are positive. So, or non-negative. Yeah, I should say non-negative Grassmannian, not positive. I say positive. Yeah. So, positive means non-negative. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, how is it related to these graphs? So, uh, the graph is a way how to construct such a matrix. So, we draw a graph with two types of three-point vertices, the same, the white and blue, as we had before. And now we associate vari variables with faces of that diagram. Yeah? So let's draw it on the disk. Uh, planar diagrams can be drawn on the disk. Everything is on the disk. And for each face, we associate a variable. So let's say f0 is here in the middle, f1, f2, f3, f4. Now there is some property that the product of all these face variables, we call them face variables, uh, is minus 1. Yeah? So one of them is redundant but all the other ones are independent. OK? Now, uh, the next step is to do uh, add arrows to the diagram. It's called perfect orientation. And uh, the rule is that whenever, so first we choose uh, the sources and sinks. So we choose which arrows go in and which go out in the diagram. For this, we have to choose two going in and two going out. It corresponds to this k. Yeah? So I already gave you the formula how to calculate k. In the context of physics, it had something to do with helicities of amplitudes. But here, forget it. It's, uh, it's just the number of incoming and outgoing, uh, outgoing uh, arrows. And the k is calculated using this number of white, black, minus number of propagators, and so on. There was this formula for that. So in this case, k is 2, and n is 4. So it's a G24 Grassmannian. OK, so the rule is that uh, once I choose my arrows going in and going out, I can choose it arbitrary. It just must to be 2 and 2. Then I fill the rest in the middle with the arrows such that in the white vertex, one arrow goes in and two out. And in the blue vertex, two go in and one goes out. And uh, now this perfect orientation, the way how to choose the arrows is not unique, but the the theorem is that there always exists at least one. There can be more, but at least one always exists, which satisfies these properties. So we have, in general, k incoming and n minus k outgoing arrows in a gen generic playbook graph. 
And now uh, the next thing, what we have to do is the boundary measurement. And the boundary measurement is calculating the entry of the k by n matrix using these fact variables. And this is, this is the formula. So C, A, B, so A, B are indices. A is an incoming label. So in that case, it's one and two. And B is, if it is incoming, so, B, so A in this example runs from one to two, B runs from one to four over all labels. So in general, this is K and this is N, that's our length, K and N. So uh, if A, A is always incoming, if B is also incoming, so we're going from one to one or one to two, of course, it's not possible to go in the graph, yeah? So here, this thing will track the paths in the graph. So if A goes to A, we just say it's one, but if A goes to something else, uh, then some other, so for example, C11 is one, but C12 is zero. Yeah, you cannot find any path which goes from one to two. Uh, from one to one, we just define that it's one. Now, so these are the trivial ones. The non-trivial ones is if there exists a path from incoming to outgoing. And in that case, the rule is that uh, you take the product of all face variables, which are on the right from the path, and if there are more paths, you sum over them. And there are some minus signs here and here in the definition. Okay, so let me get, so it's clear what is this definition, yeah. Just some formula, take the products of all face variables in the diagram on the right from the path from A to B, and sum over all paths in case there is more than one. Let me do it in this example. In this example we just had. So let's calculate C13. So going from one to three. There is only one path in the diagram, the way how I label that, but it all depends on this perfect orientation. You could label it differently, you could different entries, but in the end it will be all equivalent. Uh, so from one to three, there is only one path. Here it is in blue. So the product of uh, all these uh, face variables is F0, F3, F4, and there are some minus signs here and here. If you go from one to four, there are two paths. You either go around or you just go straight. So it's a sum of two terms. Here, uh, two goes to three is a one term, two goes to four, it's a one term. Yeah? So this is the rule how to, how to calculate the entries of this uh, two by four matrix. So here is the matrix, once we do all these calculations. In terms of these Fs, you see that F2 doesn't show up. We already said that one of the variables is redundant, so F2 in this case is redundant, just doesn't show up in the result. So all these Fs are then independent. And now the statement is, so I just parameterized two by four matrix, but the statement is that that always exists a choice of signs for F such that this matrix has all main minors positive. In this case, it might look kind of simple, it's just two by two minors, but if you imagine K by N, it's a very non-trivial statement. You have huge, you have huge number of minors, and uh, the fact that you can make them positive is super non-trivial. So in this case, if you just calculate all two by two minors, you can quickly realize that this is the choice of signs which makes everything positive. But this is a simple example, yeah. Okay, now let me just mention that I so use mostly these face variables. There exists another way how to parameterize the metrics using so-called edge variables. So instead of associating variables with faces, for each edge we write one variable. Now, uh, <clears throat> the way how to calculate the entry of the Grassmannian metrics is uh, analogous. Here I take the path, let's say, from one to three, and the thing that I have to do is to take the product of all edge variables along the way and sum over all paths from here to here. Again, with the same choice, if one goes to one or one goes to two and no paths exist. Now, the, the, so it's kind of natural to have these edge variables because it's just the product along the path. The thing which is... Uh, these variables are not that invariant. There is a redundancy because obviously you can see that you have eight variables here, but we had only four variables or five variables in face variables, modulo one, which we can remove. Here we have much more, many, many more of them. 
And the rule is that in each vertex, you can choose one of the variables to one or anything you like. Yeah? And you just have to do consistently. You cannot choose alpha 5 from this vertex to be 1 and alpha 5 from this vertex to be 1. You have just to make the choices consistently such that each, each vertex is one edge variable. Yeah. So then you have four vertices. 8 minus 4 is 4. So there are really just four independent ones. OK, so these are edge variables, which also parameterize the Grassmannian matrix. And yeah, so this is a different parameterization of the positive Grassmannian. Now, yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, there is. There is a dictionary. I'm not showing the form one. There is a simple dictionary between them. Well, there is one good thing about these edge variables I like, is that uh, if you set the variable to zero, it erases that edge, yeah? which is kind of a cool property. Yeah. So if suppose that I set alpha 5 to 0 uh, in this formula, it would correspond to a different on-shell diagram yeah? when uh, this edge will be erased. And uh, this will be a parameterization of that on-shell diagram. Yeah. Here it will be a pretty trivial one. Yeah? But, uh, so the edge variables have this nice property that sending them to 0, erasing the edges. And again, with the positivity, the same thing is true as if in the face variables there exists a choice of sign such that uh, for alpha, such that this matrix is a positive Grassmannian. It's a cell in positive Grassmannian. Okay, so that's why I'm going to do it. So now the uh, cell in positive Grassmannian, which are these uh, matrices, the cell in general is specified by a set of non vanishing Plucker coordinates. But uh, instead of algebraically, I like to think about it more geometrically. So uh, I would like to think about the k by n matrix. Uh, the, way, the one way how to think about it is that you think about it as the rows. So you have uh, k vectors in n-dimensional space, or you have, uh, you, have, uh, sorry. you have k rows or and uh, uh, well, and uh, you have rows or, or you have columns, so you can think about it like that or like that. So I would like to think about it like that. So I have some k-dimensional space. Well, it's a projective space, pk minus 1, and I have n points in this space. And for a given matrix, I can just look what is the configuration of these points. Yeah? Or these vectors describe the points in that space. And what does the positivity mean? Yeah, if I just think about it as configuration of points, having a Grassmannian, positive Grassmannian, a cell in positive Grassmannian, what does it imply for this configuration? And that's very useful. OK, so let me show this example. So I have a G36 example. So I have six points in P2, in projective space. And uh, if uh, this we can also parameterize. So this is a particular. This is a particular configuration. You, for example, see that uh, there is one and two. Three and four points are on top of each other. So I can write C4 as a multiple of C3 as the vectors, and then five. And these guys is on a line. So five is a linear combination of two and three, and six is a linear combination of five and one. Uh, Okay, now uh, you can quickly realize once you just do this translation into a matrix is that this matrix has positive minors. Yeah, uh, if you choose these parameters, it has the appropriate sign. For example, three is between two and five, which means that it's two plus some positive value of five and so on. So you have to do it appropriate. But if you do it, this matrix has positive minors, so it's a cell in positive Grassmannian. So the positivity meets convexity in these configurations. So uh, if you have the positive Grassmannian matrix, you can always translate the statement about the cell, about the particular form, into this geometric setting of drawing a configuration, or in general is saying, what are the linear, what are the conditions, linear conditions between consecutive points in that configuration? You see that this here, the conditions are between consecutive points. I am saying that three and four are on top of each other. Two, three, four, and five are on a line. I'm not saying that two, three, four, and six are on a line. That would be not consecutive points. 
So that will not correspond to anything in the positive Grassmannia. Yeah. Yes, but a special one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there is an underlying Metroid, but the positive Grassmannian is much more special because there are only linear dependencies between consecutive points. Yeah, you cannot have one, three, five on a line. Yeah. Three, four on top of each other. They are in one point. So as the vectors, they are, they are proportional. Yeah. So, uh, so that's the special thing. So we have general Metroid, some, some GKN thing, but uh, the positive Grassmannian is much more special because it's only these conservative points, the linear dependencies. Yeah. And that is exactly this statement is analog of the positivity. Okay, so now, uh, so there is stratification of the space. So, for example, in this G36 example, I can start with G36, a top cell, so when no constraints are imposed, it's maximal dimensional, so G36 is nine dimensional, uh, and it would be this convex configuration of points. Now, uh, I, I can go to the boundary when I impose a constraint, so the constraint here is, must be cons between consecutive points. And so I can impose that four, five, six are on a line. So that would be a co-dimension one boundary. Yeah, so I impose one constraint. It's only eight-dimension configuration. And now I can go farther. I can say that two, three, four are on a line. It's co-dimension two. And then I can say I can move three on top of four. So I get this configuration. I can continue. But the only constraints I can impose are between consecutive points. I cannot say that one, two, and four are on a line. That's not a boundary of the space. That would violate the positivity of the underlying grass, positive Grassmannian matrix. It would be not a cell in positive Grassmannian. Yeah? So positivity, convexity, and these uh, consecutive points. Uh, OK. So, and now what is the relation to permutations? So there is a simple relation between uh, the configurations, these configurations of points corresponding to the cell in positive Grassmannian and permutations. And you can just read off the permutation from the picture. Uh, so if I have picture like that, so what is the permutation I goes to sigma i? The rule is that i is spent by all the points i plus one, i plus two up to sigma i. So if I have point one, how many points do I have to go through in order to span one? So two, two is not enough. Two, three, four is not enough because that's just this line. Two, three, four, five, two, three, four, five is still not enough. I have to go up to six. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah? Now, if I have two, two is not spent by three and four. They are on the top of each other. So it's spent by three, four, and five. So sigma 2 is 5, yeah? And I continue. 3 is spent by 4 by itself. They are on top of each other. So sigma 3 is 4. And I so on. I can fill the permutation, yeah? So this picture corresponds to permutation. 6, 5, 4, 2, 1, 3. Yeah? And, well, okay, here it's in the plane, and it's only these conditions, but I can go to GKN, to the general space. It would be a higher dimensional space. I, can, I cannot draw it anymore, but it's the same statement. The only configurations allowed are constraints between consecutive points, and uh, similarly, I can read off the permutation. I choose G36 because I can draw it on a plane. Yeah. Okay, now there is a notion of the boundary operator and stratification. So uh, <clears throat> the boundary operator, so I have one configuration, and I can draw all its boundaries, uh, which corresponds to making it more special, following these rules that it must be between consecutive points. And <clears throat> because we have these permutations, I can go from the configuration to permutation and then draw the corresponding playback graph. Yeah? Or I can directly take these things and figure out what is the cell in positive Grassmannian, and then construct the, 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 the black, play big graph from that. But taking the boundary at the level of these configurations is the same as taking the boundary at the level of these play big graphs by erasing an edge. Yeah? It's in one-to-one -one correspondence. So all these things are related. Yeah? Uh, now, you can do something more. You can actually completely stratify the space. And I'm able to here to do it 
for the G24 example, for the simplest one, which was actually done a long time ago by McPherson and Gelfand. And uh, that's starting G24 is just four points on a line, ordered points on a line, that's all. With kind of the thing that four and one are also adjacent, so it's kind of connected at infinity. And uh, the stratification is that you start with the top cell, no constraints imposed, and then you draw these diagrams, then you impose one constraint, and this configuration, the only thing that you can do is to jam consecutive points. You can jam one, two, two, three, three, four, or four, one. Yeah? That's the only codimension one thing that you can do. In the next step, you can either, you have more options, so there are more types of boundaries. If you have one, two, let's take this one, two, three, four, one, when three and four are jammed, you can either jam one and two, that's this one, or you can jam two, three, four, two, three and four, three, four are already on top of each other, so you just move two there, that's this one, but you can also delete three or delete four. Yeah? So you basically say that three and four are already proportional as vectors, you just say that the constant of proportionality is zero. Yeah? So you just delete three or four, or the other option is that you gem three, four, and one, yeah. So one is next to four, so you can also do that, yeah. Well, and then you just do it here. This, in this case, the space is four-dimensional, so you just draw that. And on the button, the thing which is zero-dimensional is that you just have two points, one, two, two, three, and the other points. You can see it easily in the, in the Grassmannian case because you always gauge fix two of the columns in G24. This is the things that you don't touch and then you send the rest thing to zero. Uh, so, so this is the stratification, but of course this stratification exists for all, set, all, all positive Grassmannians for GKN. The interesting topological thing is that if you calculate the Euler characteristic of this, it's a topologically ball, which is extremely non-trivial if you just count the number of boundaries of different dimensions. Well, here it's kind of not that impressive, but if you go to higher examples, you have huge numbers in between, and if you take the alternative sum, yeah, you just uh, get that it's topologically ball. It just sums to one. Okay, so, so, so here the summary. So we have these reduced graphs, mod uh, identity moves, so play big graphs. We had permutations, we had configurations of vectors with linear dependencies, and we had cells in positive Grassmannians. All of them are related to each other in this way. Okay, so let me just, I haven't I said nothing about cluster algebra, so let me just say a little bit, uh, I'm sure that this will be developed later, just a small spoiler of why, uh, why this is related to cluster algebras. So, uh, <clears throat> without saying anything more, uh, let me just say that uh, uh, abstractly I can define a seed it's a set of combinatorical data. I will just say in a second how it realizes here, yeah. I will not continue in uh, just the abstract definition. But you have some set S, frozen set as zero, it's a subset of that, and adjacent symmetrics. And the adjacent symmetrics, uh, the entries i and j are integers. If i and j are in S, and half integers, if they are both in S zero. Yeah, so you define the metrics. And then I declare there is something called mutation in direction k, and there is something called cluster x coordinates, and under this mutation, the cluster x coordinates transform as this expression. So they will be here in this, if, uh, uh, if xi is equal, if i is equal to k, then, uh, you see that it's mutation direction of k, you just get one over xk, and if it is not, you get this more complicated expression, which has these entries of the adjacent symmetrics here in the exponent, and then there is some sign here. Yeah. So without saying anything more, this is just uh, the definition, but why do I say it? Because we have exactly that structure for these graphs. So the, the set are the phase variables. So S is for this graph F0, F1, F2, F3, and F4. The frozen variables are the ones at the external faces. So the ones which are between two external lines. So in this case, F1, F2, F3, and F4. Yeah? So this is the, in the seed, this is the set, 
and the S set and S zero subset. So these are dead variables. Well, the important thing is that if you do this mutation, uh, you transform the variables F0, F1, F2, F3, and F4 in this particular way. So we are doing the mutation in direction zero here. And uh, the thing is that this preserves the cell in the positive Grassmannian. If you start with these phase variables for the cell in the positive Grassmannian, which parameterize it, you do this mutation uh, of these variables, you, you preserve the cell. So it is still positive even after you do it. So these F, uh, these phase variables are cluster X coordinates. So that's the connection to the cluster algebras. I'm sure hopefully you will learn more about these things later. So why, why these graphs are related here? And what does it do to the graph? So what it does is that it does this square move. So this mutation uh, is the square move at the level of graphs. And uh, this is the way how the variables transform. So you start with these variables, you do the square move, and new variables, these till and turn prime variables, are related to the original ones according to this formula. So the square move is a cluster transformation. Okay. And uh, so that's that. So the square move preserves the cell in positive Grassmannian. And uh, this uh, merge expand, that was the other one. This is kind of trivial in terms of these variables. You just do nothing. Yeah, you just keep the variables as it is after that. The square move is more interesting one. Uh, OK, so, so far these were unrelated stories between this physics and math. So we, uh, we have the same graphs, but it still could be just coincidence, because these are very generic graph theoretical things, just graphs with two types of three-point vertices. On one side, we calculated them as some products of uh, three-point amplitudes. On the other side, we constructed the sa some cell in positive Grassmannian. Kind of one hint that it's not completely unrelated is that they satisfy the same identity moves. And that was crucial, these identity moves on both sides. But still, how, what is the connection between these things? And here is the connection. So uh, you can take you start from the math side, uh, you calculate the C matrix for a given graph using all this procedure I, I spoke about, and you write a differential form, which is just the natural logarithmic differential form in all variables. Sorry, I will go a little over time. And uh, on this differential form, you impose some delta function. I say what is the, I mean by this delta function. But uh, it basically imposes conditions on these f's, and it relates these f's to lambda, lambda, tilde we had in physics. I say exactly how it works. But the statement is that now this thing calculates this thing. Yeah? It's the same expressions. So as was this question about the Lagrangians, here you can still see some physics, but here all the physics is actually removed. It's no Lagrangian, no theory. The only, so here, this part, without the delta function, it would be just some differential form on the cell in positive Grassmannian. Adding the delta function adds the dependence on kinematics. And in the end, the surprising statement is that that calculates these on-shell diagrams from which you can construct the scattering amplitude. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, these cluster transformations, as we saw, they preserve the cell in the positive Grassmannian, and they also, very importantly, the form, the logarithmic form, is invariant under these cluster transformations. You start with a logarithmic form in the original variables, you do the cluster transformation, the square move, and you still get the logarithmic form in the new variables. So that's the crucial link. So therefore, we can be confident uh, that the picture is correct. So what does this delta function mean? Uh, so this goes a little bit into details, but uh, otherwise it look, would look like black box. So I just want to fill here this detail. So I call the delta function c dot z. By that, I really mean two delta functions, c dot lambda tilde and c perp, the orthogonal Grassmannian dot lambda. I will say in details what I mean by that. So <clears throat> what is the motivation? How do we get, naturally, uh, these delta functions? And it's the momentum conservation. So the momentum conservation is just the statement that the sum of all momenta is zero. 
uh, going into the graph. And in terms of these uh, spinner helicity variables, it's a quadratic condition because p is quadratic in lambda lambda tilde. It means that the sum over all the products, lambda lambda tilde, so it's a two by two matrix instead of a four vector, but the sum of all entries of this two by two matrix is zero. But if I think about the two by two matrix, because it just has determinant one, it's a product of two vectors, it's quadratic. Now, I wanted to make it linear. I just wanted to write a separate condition for lambda and separate condition for lambda tilde. So that's the motivation why the Gramanian even appears in context. And now, <clears throat> if I demand that these two conditions, so again, don't be confused, I use delta function, but what I really mean is a condition that the argument is zero. Yeah? So I don't use the delta function in some fancy way, just the argument is zero. It's a condition that I impose. So you can ask when this condition is included in these two conditions, yeah? separately on lambda, lambda, tilde. And the answer is when D, this matrix D, is C perp, is an orthogonal uh, complement to C. So in that case, these two conditions would restore the original quadratic condition. Now, what is the geometric statement? So this might look uh, confusing, but geometrically, something very simple. Uh, the lambda and lambda tilde, lambda has two components, and there is n of them for n particles. So you can think about lambda and lambda tilde as two planes in n dimensions. Yeah? So I just draw it in a matrix. Lambda has two components. There is n of them. And now I think about the columns as vectors. So it's a two plane in n dimension. Ah, sorry. Yeah. I think about it as a two plane in n dimension. And the same thing for lambda tilde. Now, the momentum conservation is a statement. So this is a two plane. I just denote it by arrow, but because we are in four dimensions, so I wouldn't be able to draw it. So the two plane lambda and lambda tilde are orthogonal. That's the statement that the lambda lambda tilde is zero. Lambda dot lambda tilde is zero as the statement about matrices. Yeah. So these two planes are orthogonal. Uh, these two planes are orthogonal in four dimensions. In, but here, it's in this n-dimensional space because it's the space of these indices. Yeah. So now, I want to trivialize that condition. So I'm just saying that I introduce a k-plane in n-dimensions, C, and I force C, uh, lambda tilde, to be orthogonal to C, and I force lambda to be contained in C. Once I force these two conditions separately, Lambda is contained in C and lambda tilde is orthogonal. This the statement that these guys are orthogonal is a trivial consequence of that. Yeah? Because here, this was in a plane, this was orthogonal. If lambda tilde is orthogonal to the full plane, it's definitely orthogonal to the two plane which is included in that C plane. Yeah? OK. Yeah. So, so, so the C plane for us, it's trivializing this quadratic momentum conservation. OK, anyway, so how do I now think about this, this expression I wrote? So there is a d log form in these phase variables. There is this delta function, which has this form. You can forget, this is just for completeness. There is also some terms using fermionic variables. We are in supersymmetric theory. There are some fermionic variables. But let me ignore the details about it. Yeah. Uh, this is a polynomial in some fermionic variables. The delta function in fermionic variables is just polynomial. So these two conditions, they restore this momentum conservation. And they can also solve for some of the f's, or for all of them, for these variables, in terms of lambda, lambda, tilde. Yeah? So in the end, so then I use this simple kind of replacement formula. If I have df over f, delta function f minus f0, when f0 is some fixed thing using lambda, lambda, tilde. Then I just replace it by 1 over f0. Yeah. So that's, that's the reason why I put integral here. We don't integrate anything. Yeah. We really just do this replacement. That's all we do. Yeah. So therefore, uh, this expression then reproduces some expressions using only these kinematical variables. Yeah. Because uh, this delta function basically solves for these f's in terms of these uh, lambda lambda kinematical variables. OK, so that's the connection between them. How can we derive it? Uh, 
well, let me just uh, say it in a very sketchy way. Well, you can kind of ignore these formulas. You can easily do it for free point. For free point, I showed you the expression for free point amplitudes. You can trivially rewrite them as these type of integrals for G1 free and G2 free Grassmannian. That's a very trivial change of variables. Let me ignore the details. For free point, it works trivially. For free point, this connection is a simple one, which you can do on fingers. But then the main statement is that from free point, using amalgamation procedure, you can build bigger, bigger uh, diagrams when it still holds. Yeah? So that's the important step. So the gluing preserves positivity of the minors and it preserves the differential form, just the form grows. Yeah? So you have form for that, form for that, you draw the diagram, you merge these forms, and they still are logarithmic, they still, they still have the same form. Yeah. Uh, well, you get a different Grassmannian, you see it grows, yeah, because you, you yeah, it's, uh, you start with these simple building blocks, you glue them together, you get larger and larger Grassmannians, but they are still positive Grassmannians, that's the first statement. And the other statement is that the differential form is preserved. Yeah. So the stratification is now different for these things because they are different GKNs, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but there is a way how to map kind of which cell is here and, well, these are just free points, yeah? these, these are top cells, but uh, you can figure out which cell you actually build here, yeah. But, uh, okay, so the new procedure that we have here, so we write the amplitude as a sum of uh, on-shell diagrams using recursion relations. But instead of now calculate on-shell diagrams from the definition in physics, I do this alternative way that for each diagram I construct the cell in the positive Grassmannian, the C matrix using boundary measurement, and then I write the logarithmic form which calculates it. And let me just stress this is valid in this uh, theory, beta n equals 4 supreme. We have some ideas how to work beyond something was done, but the crystal clear story is in this theory. Okay, and that brings me to the conclusion. Okay, so the summary, on-shell diagrams are interesting uh, objects in physics and they are the same as playbig graphs. They represent the cells of in positive Grassmannian. The phase variables are the cluster X variables you will probably hear about later this week, but that's the connection to the cluster, variable, uh, the, uh, <coughs> cluster algebras. And the identity moves are cluster transformations. And it all has meaning on both sides, on the math and physics sides of the story. Now, the scattering amplitudes is a sum of these diagrams, when for each diagram, we either have this formula or this formula, and they are the same. Now, let me just mention uh, some of the other related developments. I will have no time uh, to go in details. But uh, even with this, with this story, the mathematical part was completely satisfactory. But the physics part, there was a slight uh, thing that we didn't like, because the amplitude is a sum of diagrams. Yeah, so it's not a one object. It's better than Feynman diagrams, obviously, but it's still a sum of diagrams. And which particular sum it is was given by these recursion relations. And the recursion relations is uh, just uh, uh, philosophically, it's directly the consequence of unitarity in quantum field theory. So our motivation in the beginning was kind of remove the physics completely from the story and find the mathematical definition of the scattering amplitude. Say, what is the object mathematically if you knew nothing about physics and you didn't want to connect it? This was the step and this was not true. Once I have individual diagram, I can define it purely mathematically, but the amplitude I cannot. It's a sum of things and the sum is given by physics. And uh, this last step uh, was this work on the amplitohedron when, uh, roughly speaking, the on-shell diagrams glue together geometrically, but they don't glue together in GKN. You have to actually do some projection into other space. So you have to do the projection to some space which is GKK plus four. It's not a positive Grassmannian space, but it's a projection. It's basically, you project GKN through some other Grassmannian GNK plus four, and you get a smaller Grassmannian GKK plus four, and then these on shell diagrams glue together in that one, in this smaller space. There is also extension to loops. This I, I'm just saying 
What is it for trees? Well, look too abstract, but let me give you an example of what I mean by that. So in the simplest example, the amplitude is a differential form on the polygon in a plane. Yeah. In this case, it's actually even an array of the polygon. But uh, it's, uh, it's a polygon in the plane, and the triangulation, in terms of triangles, these triangles are the on-shell diagrams. So this is very heuristically, but this is actually exactly true for this simplest case. For more complicated cases, I cannot draw what the object is, but I can give the algebraic definition of that. From the mathematical point of view, it's still not completely understood. So the thing which, is, which was true for positive Grassmannian here, so sorry, this will be G plus Kn. Right? This is a positive Grassmannian here. Uh, this is not positive. Uh, uh, which was known here in terms of these playbook graphs, stratification, all these nice things, we don't know for this one. But there are some first attempts for simple examples. Lauren Williams and other people tried, uh, Thomas Lam also. Uh, to do things with that. Uh, so hopefully there will be a complete story analogous to the positive Grassmannian also for this amplitudehedron. Now, let me just mention very quickly these non-planar diagrams because I restrict myself to just planar ones, but I think there is something very interesting for these non-planar ones. I definitely draw them, obviously. I just can glue these vertices and get a non-planar graph. I can do the boundary measurement using edge variables and construct the C matrix. There is also a way how to use phase variables, but I kind am of more, uh, for me, is uh, more familiar to the edge variables because the edges, uh, there is a unique, the edges, the definition of the edge doesn't differ between planar and non-planar. Uh, if you take the diagram, what do you mean by phase? You have to draw it on some surface in order to make sense of what is the phase. Yeah, but the edge doesn't matter how you draw it. Now, the connection to physics is that this diagram calculated in physics has the same differential form as before. It's the same formula. The only thing that we don't know is how to calculate the amplitude from these diagrams. We calculate them as building blocks. They are perfectly fine. But how, they, how to put them together to get the non-planar amplitude, we don't know. Uh, there, is, there are some principal difficulties. I can say something about it. Uh, but also, the mathematics of non-planar play big graphs is not known. So that's the other thing. There is no positive Grassmannian. The positive Grassmannian was related to the cyclic ordering and the diagrams drawn on a disk. You see there is no cyclic ordering here in that diagram. Uh, and naively, it's very complicated because it's related to the matroid in general. And that's my understanding from the interaction of uh, this type of mathematicians is that just to classify all the cells in matroid or anything like that is super complicated, especially because of some accidental relations. You just pose some constraints, bunch of things are on the planes and lines, and then accidentally some other things are also on the planes and lines. And it's very hard to say in advance when it happens. Okay, the only case when we understand it is G, G2N. In the simplest case of K equals 2, actually we have a complete understanding. And it's a very simple thing, actually, uh, that gluing together different positive Grassmannians with different orderings gives these non-planar graphs. Yeah, so there is a decomposition of the non-planar graph in, a, into, in terms of a sum of planar graphs. And the space is literally just gluing together different G2Ns with different orderings. Yeah? So there is some very nice mathematical story for that. Unfortunately, it's not true in general. Starting k equals 3, it's not true. Yeah, it's, you cannot decompose the non-planar thing in terms of the planar. My guess is, uh, so in general, you are in this matroid business. My guess is that the similar structure like positive Grassmannian is associated with any non-planar uh, play big graph. But uh, it's something, it's a different space, but it has the same flavor. It has stratification. It probably is not a ball, topologically. But why do I think it's true? We can study these things in physics, yeah? Because we can draw the graph, we can associate a differential form for that, and we can go, we can actually, we can probe the stratification by just deleting edges in the graph. And we have associated forms. So, so very optimistically, we can, can draw some geometric uh, picture which is different from the convex point, something else, which has the same thing. That if you delete an edge in the play big graph, it corresponds to specializing a geometric configuration. So that's my wake idea 
how to pursue that. There are some data. Uh, these guys actually studied these diagrams, so there are some hard data which can be used, but it needs some intuition uh, for what it can be. Okay, so let me mention in the end some resources. So we wrote a paper on this, which is also published as a book, uh, if you want to read more about it. And uh, let me also mention uh, one more thing. So in our new, uh, newly established center at UC Davis, uh, we also organize uh, uh, some events. It's much smaller scale than here, of course. But uh, this year, we organized a summer school on scattering amplitudes, and we had interesting lectures by Alex Postnikov, who was involved in this subject on the mathematical side, and also some longer lecture by my former advisor, Nima, on the physics aspect of the story. And it's, everything is on YouTube. You can also look at it. Thank you very much. Is it on? OK. So uh, I would be grateful if you could just elaborate on this idea of gluing Grassmannians that you, yeah, that you pointed out at the very end as a very mat neat mathematical construction. I don't really understand what you mean by gluing positive Grassmannians together. No, there is a way how to like jam these matrices together. Yeah. Uh, so you start with G1 free and G2 free and you build a G24 in the first step out of them. Yeah, and then you add, yeah, well, there is an algebraic prescription, what do you mean by gluing uh, the Grassmannians together? Yeah, so you take the entries of the matrix and you put them into bigger matrix, and that preserves the positivity. Yeah. And you relate the face variables in the original ones to the face variables in the new one, yeah, or edge variables. So that, that is mean, Graphically, it's gluing. Algebraically, it's relating the entries of smaller Grassmannians to the entry of the bigger Grassmannian. Well, that is the non-trivial part, yes. Yeah. Right? I, well, I cannot say it in words, yeah. It was, <laughs> yeah. That was some... <laughs> Difficult theorem to prove, yeah, so, uh, yeah, it, it's just, uh, well, once you, once you have a prescription, how to take the entries of the smaller matrices and put them in the bigger matrix, and that's, well, it's not just that, you have to also show that it's the same matrix as given by the boundary measurements of that graph, yeah, it's not just a random matrix, it must be the appropriate Grassmannian self for that diagram, and then, yeah, and then, uh, well, once you know that, then it's positive, because you know that the boundary measurement gives you positive matrices, but you have to show that it's given by the same matrix. Yeah, but with the big metrics, we don't decompose it into. That was on the physics side. We took the product of three point amplitudes. That was how it was defined on the physics side. But on the math side, you just have a diagram, you have a matrix, and that's it. Yeah, and you do the boundary measurement to determine the, to, to, to determine the matrix. You don't decompose the matrix into small grass money. I don't, yeah, that, 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 yeah, that, that's not what you do. You can do it the other way. That, that's how you prove that uh, uh, the. That is how you prove the boundary measurement that it gives you the metrics. Because the only thing that you can be for sure is just for these three points, which are very simple. But then if you go up, how do you know that the boundary measurement gives you positive metrics? Well, you don't know in general, but you prove it using amalgamation procedure. Maybe there is some other way how to prove it as well. Yeah, but that's the way how I know about it. Are there any other questions? Yeah, log on. Yeah, so this particular differential form that you had, uh, you said that's invariant under these uh, mutations. Yeah. Is that true also about the delta functions? Yes, yes, yes. Well, it changes the form of the matrix, but it gives you the same, it gives you the same result in the end. So it's true also for the delta function. It's actually, uh, let me just, a few things. So it's true for that. Uh, if you write other form, it wouldn't be true. 
And uh, you can also ask this question, why it has anything to do with n equals 4 super young mills. Yeah, there was why this differential form and so on. So this is a little bit hint why, because in n equals 4 super young mills, uh, it would be exactly invariant under that move on the graphs. And if you take other theory, like pure young mills or gravity, it would be not. Yeah. So that's just because of the number of supersymmetries? So. Yeah, because of the number of supersymmetries. The supersymmetry is very important in the way how it works and so on. So the differential form is the simplest one because n equals 4, from that point of view, is the simplest one. It has this huge amount of symmetries or properties under which it's invariant. Yeah. Uh, just one more question. So these uh, edge variables, are they related to some Feynman parameters in the physics sense? Or? These f variables? Yeah. Uh, no, 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 you cannot, uh, no, you, no, it's not related to Feynman uh, parameters, yeah, so... Uh, are, are they the variables in the BCFW regressions? Uh, the edge variables are corresponds to BCFW. You, yeah. So the edge yeah. variables correspond to BCFW shifts. That is true. There is some very wild speculation <laughs> that, uh, uh, of course, the thing that I didn't talk anything about is that in the end you have to do some loop integrals and you, we don't do them here. In, uh, uh, so you can ask, I, well, basically everything which I showed was three level things. But I said that it also works for loop integrants. So how do the loop integrants come out of that? Well, they come from the graphs, which are non-reduced graphs. Yeah, so they are not the graphs labeled by permutation. They have some internal bubbles in it. Each internal bubble carries one extra variable. And for example, if you have one loop, you get four extra variables. So the result is four integrations, which are not fixed by delta functions. So you just get four net extra integrations, df over f for four variables. Now, these four variables are four degrees of freedom in the loop momentum you should integrate over. The thing that the diagram doesn't tell you or we don't know yet is how you should integrate it. Yeah, you have just df over f or df1 over f1, df2 over f2 up to df4 over f4. You don't have any contour. Yeah, just do this integral. It doesn't make any sense to do that integral. So the thing which is basically, therefore I said about, that it's about integrands because which is missing in the story is the contour. Yeah. For the contour, we have to go back to physics. We have to say we want to integrate over R31, the Minkowski contour. We have to change Fs to loop momenta and do the integration. So then we don't gain anything on that side. Once you start to integrate, it's the old story. And we have to reparameterize the thing. The thing which is missing here, which might be there, but I don't know how at the moment, is that there is some natural integration region in that space that you want to integrate over. Uh, but that's not part of the story at the moment. Yeah. So these f variables, yes, in this, uh, in case of the loop integrands, they are parameterizing loop momentum, but not like Feynman parameters. Just, yeah, some arbitrary way. You have to, you have to give the meaning to these variables, but that you have to borrow from physics again at that point. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, you mentioned this amplitude. Tuda Hedron, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Yeah. So, uh, can you please elaborate on that? Is it a polytope? Is it a polytope? Oh, in the simplest case, uh, it's a cyclic polytope. But uh, in general, it's a generalization to Grassmannian. So, uh, well, let's just do the cyclic polytope one, and then I should say what is the generalization. In the cyclic polytope, I can start with G1n, positive G1n, and I can project through some positive, let's say, G4n. Yeah, and I get some space, or, well, let me just, maybe, let me do the simplest one, which is this polygon. That's probably the simplest one. So I can think about, the, how do I think about the polygon? I think about it as uh, uh, these six points. So that's the C matrix, is G plus one, six. And uh, then, uh, so, Sorry, these are the coefficients, and then I have the z's, which in this case, it's a convex polygon in P2, so it's just, uh, uh, <clears throat> it, it, it's just the set of z's which form the complex polygon, which is, uh, in this case, uh, G3, 6. Yeah, so if I have G3, 6, that was the thing I also showed here, right? Uh, I have to go way back. Yeah, so this is the top cell of G3, 6. So that's the convex uh, polygon in plane. 
So the Zs also form convex polygon. That's the important part. So they are the top cell of G36. And here I have the set of coefficients. The point Y is the point inside that polygon, which is a linear combination of Zs with positive coefficients. If I have that, it's inside. So I can think about it as a map from G plus 1, 6 to just G13, just a general polygon. But now no, not positive, right? Or it's not a positive Grassmannian because it's a polygon. The positive Grassmannian would be G13 here. It would be a single triangle, but it's a polygon. So it's, uh, it's not in any particular triangle. So it's a generalization of that polygon is the amplitudehedron. So here the... Here we glue together the triangles, if you then think about it as cells in positive Grassmannian, but they don't glue together in G16. Yeah, that's the thing. They glue together in G13 here, these individual cells. So you have to do this projection. And uh, if you go to higher dimensions, in for k equals 1, it's a cyclic polytop in, in higher dimensions. But for k not equal to 1, <laughs> it's not. So that's the thing that I said. There is not... There is some understanding for k equals 2 for some simple case. That's what Warren Williams did. But in general, we don't know. It's not polytops. It's some, yeah, whatever, yeah. It's a subspace in Grassmannian, but not the positive Grassmannian. But it's an interesting one because it's a projection from other positive Grassmannian. And uh, the amplitude, well, I didn't say what is the amplitude once I have this space. The amplitude is a logarithmic form on that space. So the same thing which was true for the individual cells when it was this logarithmic form, it's now logarithmic form on this space, but you see it's not that trivial because in the case of triangle, the logarithmic form is just dx over x, dy over y, it's a two-dimensional space. But this thing has not two, but it has many more boundaries. So it's still a two form, but it's some, it has six things in the denominator. It's a complicated form with a numerator. But it's unique because if you can show that if you, if you demand it as only logarithmic singularities, that form is unique. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so we understand it from physics. We can show that it gives the amplitude, but the precise mathematical understanding what this space is, we don't have. Yeah. More questions? In that case, thank you for your questions. And uh...